Welcome to Words Carry Us, an ongoing series of live stream events and uh, of live stream events featuring readings and interviews from Greenkill in Kingston, New York. I'm Betty McDonald, writer, storyteller, and host of Words Carry Us. Before I introduce tonight's guest, I'd like to read my essay, Oysters, in honor of my father's 120th birthday. Oysters. When Daddy wasn't at his desk on the old-fashioned old balcony overseeing the customers and salespeople in the family store, he was out on Hall Street talking with the other shopkeepers, which was considered goofing off by my hard-working mother and grandmother and my chronically dis disappointed uncle. They didn't get, oh boy, they didn't get it that this genial reaching out gave him a sense of himself as a worthwhile person. It fulfilled his need for companionship and informed his ability to be a good and creative provider. It was from his cohorts he got the goods on where to get the juiciest peaches, the sweetest corn, and the endless sides of beef he bought directly from the farmer. He was amiable, he liked to talk, and people liked to talk to him. Meyer's dry goods store carried men's, women's, and children's clothing, shoes and hats, fabric, yarn, and sewing net notions. When it was closing time at the end of the day, my mom or my grandma would come and rouse me from where I was waiting in the three-chair shoe department, drawing on discarded cardboard boxes. And they would send me to Arnesty's Grill to find my father. Scooting down to the end of the block on my mission, I pushed open the heavy door of the small restaurant and was engulfed in the delicious aroma of Southern cooking. As I slid into the dark wooden booth next to Daddy, he slid half his fried oyster sandwich over to me and ordered a second one for us to share. I learned to eat oysters to please him. Seated on high stools at the oyster bar at Ruggie's Hotel in downtown Richmond, Virginia, Dad and I stuffed ourselves with the bounty of the nearby Chesapeake Bay. As fast as the white-jacketed server behind the counter could expertly open them. At first, I only pretended to like them raw to get his approval, but it didn't take me long to cultivate a fondness for the sweet, briny taste of the ocean. When we each had eaten a dozen oysters on the half shell, another dozen was open, plopped into a battered saucepan, and adding a splash of milk and a generous slab of butter, the saucepan was held under a live steam jet just long enough to melt the butter and heat the milk, but not long enough to overcook the oysters preserving their tenderness. Poured into white crockery bowls, it was the food of the gods. Some sat Saturday nights after closing the store, Dad would arrive home with a bushel basket of steamed hard shell crabs pulled out of the bay a couple of hours before. I was hardly old enough to sit up on my own when he taught me how to open a crab properly and discard the dead man, that's the part you weren't supposed to eat, and, con and consume the delicacy within. Along with this culinary del delight, I basked in his approval. Daddy liked to cook, but never in the kitchen. 
in the, in the fall in preparation for the annual reunion of my mother's cousins from North Carolina, he began at dawn tending a huge black iron pot hanging over an outdoor fire filled with corn, okra, tomatoes, lima beans, and chicken for his famous Brunswick stew. Red faced from, from the heat, he stirred the giant pot with a boat oar. Although the recipe for Brunswick stew handed down by generation of generations of Southern cooks typically calls for it, he never added squirrel. In a family that had long since dropped the dietary laws and despite his having been born and raised in an area that was the very essence of the Old South, he was, after all, a Russian Jew. He never added squirrel. He considered it too country. <laughs> Margarita Man, Man, I'm sorry, Margarita Mayendorf, also known as Morka, the daughter of a Russian baron, was born far from the opulence of Imperial Russia that was her family's birthright. Instead, a series of wars destroyed this privileged existence, and Morka was born displaced in a refugee camp in Germany. Marka's life has been a series of extraordinary moves. She's performed as an actress, dancer, musician, and storyteller at venues throughout the United States and in Europe, and is an award-winning author of two published books. Her memoir, DP, Displaced Person is being translated into Russian for publication in Russia. She has also published an anthology of 30 short stories entitled Flipping the Bird. <laughs> Currently, Marika is writing her third book entitled The Magic Bus about her adventures with her husband in their 1991 VW pop-up Westphalia Camper. Please welcome to Words Carry Us, my friend, Morka. Thank you, Betty. Thank you so much for that wonderful intro. <laughs> I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, well, it's very interesting how we can be wonderful friends. We've met through TMI. TMI, yes, a long too, time too ago. Too much information, a long time. And come from such different backgrounds and, uh, and still have this wonderful connection that we have. It's, right. it's very, very important. And it happens in this country, I think, more yes. than any place else. Yes, I think so. Yeah. And coming from the same place and from different places at the same time. Right, that's yes. right. So you're uh, you're now working on a new book. I yes, I'm working on several things uh, simultaneously. But I'm I'm working on yes, I want to I want to uh, uh, finish or write. I'm, I've only started the magic bus. The magic bus is is. Um, it's just a, a wonderful series of adventures. It's not a how to camp. It's literally adventures in the Westphalia camper we've had here in the United States and in Europe. We've camped. And, you know, we love it. It's very retro. It's not easy sometimes. But we love it. And I have some wonderful stories about that. But they're not the stories you're telling tonight. No. No. Tell us about the stories you're telling tonight. Well, I was, I'm here, I, I was here a few years ago with DP, Displaced Person, but I, I changed the cover. And the cover is, um, to me, very poignant and has a story in itself. So I'll start with that. Okay. Um, I think he, when, he, when he puts the, there it is, the cover. Um, and that's a picture of you. That's a picture of me, but it's superimposed on my mother's document 
to cross Nazi Germany from Vienna. So my mother's picture was there as, as the real document. Um, they were given permission to cross Nazi Germany. But the interesting thing is that my mother and I have the same name. So she has signed her name, Margarita Meindorf. So there's my picture with Margarita Meindorf <laughs> underneath it. But as I looked closer to, to the um, signature, I realized she put B-A-R as her middle name. That's not her middle name. Her middle name is Angelica. She put an abbreviation for Baroness. <laughs> Because she was a baroness. Because she was married to the baron, the Russian baron, yes. Um, and so I think he put her up to it. <laughs> 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 but those, those are Nazi stamps on, the, on that, uh, that, that uh, document. And I thought it was an interesting cover. What a chilling uh, name, a uh, displaced person. Because that was, that's how you, that's, how, that's how, how we were named when we came to this country. We literally had um, uh, tags in our lapels. And I'm talking about my father, my mother, my two half-brothers, and myself. I was two. But we had, just like baggage, and it said, displaced persons from... Uh, like baggage tags. Baggage tags. That were on right. you. Right. Yes. In our lapels. And uh, at, we had fictitious destinations. Oh, we were sponsored by Prince Belesielski, I think. That was his, uh, Prince Belesielski, who oh, was in New York, a Russian prince. Say the name again. Prince Belesielski, his name. And you, can't, you couldn't just come to a country. You had to be sponsored if you're sitting in one of those camps. And um, he sponsored us last moment because we had made all of our passports out for Buenos Aires in Argentina. Oh, you almost ended up in Buenos Aires. I almost. <laughs> was speaking fluent Spanish and, and, and dancing the Argentinian tango is what I was. <laughs> I'm so certain that I would have done that. But... Um, and why did he do it at the last minute? He, he, my father wanted to come to this country. He had more relatives here than he did in Buenos Aires. Uh, we had relatives all over the world, including Australia. I mean, every... In 19... Uh, in, in 1917, there was an explosion, and our family and many, many other families um, went to in thousands of directions. Anywhere they could get in. Anywhere they could get in or go or had family. <laughs> so um, we got to come. We got to come to the United States. And did you did the prince know your father or just yes, yes he yes, did know him. yes right the Meindorf is a fairly no known uh, aristocratic name uh, in the scheme of things Baron is like the last of the <laughs> <laughs> of the upper <laughs> echelon <laughs> and my grandfather who was. Um, General Adjutant to Tsar Nicholas II, uh, uh, he um, had 13 children. Uh -huh. So it's not like, and they had a home, a lovely home in St. Petersburg, and a summer home in Estonia. See, that's another thing that we share. Yes. Lithuania, Estonia. And a uh, summer home called Kumna. I've been there. I've been there, I've been to the summer home, in, I mean, in the St. Petersburg home. Uh, and uh, so, and they were entitled, but they, my grandmother was a rather, rather interesting person, very down to earth. Uh, and that or, was your father's mother? 
Your grandmother? My grandmother's my father's mother, right? Yes. Beekeeping, gardening, and, and you, I, I can't imagine having 13 children. I mean, she had, oh, she had 11 children, and then she had twins. Oh, my goodness. And my father was the last of the twins. Oh. So that's why 1894 he was born, and, and uh, you know, with the wars and this and that. So he went first to Estonia, your father? He went to Estonia yeah. in 1920. Uh, between 1917 and 1920, he managed to get to what the, the name of the place was Kumna. And he fought in the 1920s when the Soviets moved uh, towards Estonia. He fought for Estonian independence, wow. which is why he was able to keep, or they gave back to him, um, the land that belonged to them in the, in, the, in, in the first place. But they lost it, and then they, he, he was able to keep, I don't know, 25 hectares, or whatever they, so because he fought for, for Estonian independence. And then, of course, 1941, when the Soviets came again, they had to leave. They had to leave Estonia, yeah. and they yep. went to Germany then. They went first to Austria, to Vienna through various barriers. It took, it took a while. It must have been really rough. Wow. Yes, I think, I think that it was uh, rough. I think that uh, my mother uh, definitely had it at most difficult time. She, I think she was already uh, emotionally um, had emotional problems. Uh, she, she lost her mother at age 12 when they lived in Russia, in the part of Russia that is now the Ukraine. I, I tried to visit it and couldn't because I couldn't get a visa from the Ukraine. Wow. Yeah. So those borders have changed over the yeah. years. Yes. And um, so it was Russia when my mother lived there. She lost her mother, the mother was born there, and my mother was in love with Russia, even though she was Estonian. Her father was a railroad engineer, and, which, and he was sent to Russia to uh, work on railroads, and that's how they got to Russia. So he, she, she had 20 years of growing up in Russia before they had to leave. So what about you, so two-year-old you, Coming to this country with labels on you like a package, <laughs> what was your, what's the first thing you remember about this country? We moved into a very interesting place. It's uh, near Nyack, New York. It's in Nyack, New York, actually. And it's um, belonged to Pierre Bernard, who was, there were books written on him. He was a Tantric yoga. Uh, yeah. he, he made a world, of, uh, 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 his own world. He had been imprisoned, he had been thrown in jail. It's, there's a whole book called uh, The Great Om. That was his name. He made lots and lots of money. He had an airport, he had uh, uh, a uh, huge amount of uh, athletic places like uh, uh, baseball fields and uh, and he, because tantric yoga was very into f the physical physical so he life. had a property and he invited these russians well that was much later when he lost all his money during oh. the depression he didn't even know he was already an elderly gentleman uh -huh. and he didn't even know who was living in his renovated elephant stalls. We lived in renovated elephant stalls. What do you mean renovated? <laughs> well, he had a circus. He had a whole circus. He yeah, had... but how were the stalls renovated? But did it look like a stall or a well, room? Well, actually, there are photographs in my book uh, where you could see the front, and it's they look more like garage doors. Yeah with windows on the top. 
and um, that's where we lived. I mean, do you remember I don't living remember there? the inside yeah. as much. I remember uh, there were no real walls. There were a lot of coverings, and there were also other relatives living on the property. So it wasn't the Lapuhians, for example, lived there. And um, and what I remember, my first recollection, which is the, my first chapter in the book, is peacocks. Peacocks. Peacocks walking in front of our home. Wow. Yeah. That's what I remember. And so it was a fairly nice property. I mean, I, we had a lot of you know, places to go. I was, by that time I was three, and I could remember these things. So that was our first home. Right. And so. Do you have something that you've written about that time or about your early years? I have. Years? I, I brought things that were uh, anecdotal. Sorry. Anecdotal. And I brought, uh, the first thing I will, I will read is, is about my father. Okay. My father was a character. And he was always waiting for the Tsar to come back. Oh. And in the meantime, he was going to live in poverty in the United States. But this is called Driving with the Baron. My father, Baron George Meindorf, never drove an automobile until he came to America at age 55 in December of 1949. Soon after our family settled into the renovated elephant stalls at the Clarkstown Country Club in Nyack, it became apparent to him the necessity of driving and owning a car in the American suburbs. I don't know how he managed to get a New York's driver's license with his heavy Russian accent and lack of fluency in English, but they granted him one. For Papa, Driving an automobile was the first step towards independence in this new country. Not only was driving a necessity, but the sense of being in command fed into my father's memories of his dashing former life as a Russian baron when he rode fine steeds in steeplechase races, trained horses to jump, and English setters to hunt, a life which had vanished from his reality. As a little girl, Papa often took me with him on his drives to the city to sell his canvas designs at Rosetta Larson Needlepoint Design on Madison Avenue. He needed a decoy in case he ran into any traffic problems, which was often, I was delighted, it meant I could skip school. It was on the way to New York City that we approached a toll booth to the George Washington Bridge. Papa noticed that there was no actual person in the toll booth to take his 25 cents, the cost of the bridge at that time. Instead, there was a dish-like receptacle into which one had to throw in the money. In Russian, he said, the shorts near me. No person? The hell with them. <laughs> Papa drove through and all hell broke loose. Bells and sirens went off. I looked back as the toll takers from the man booths were running after us. My father stopped the car. I slid down under the dashboard. I was petrified that we would be taken to jail. Papa yelled to me, Nachinarivets, start crying. <laughs> And I did. It was my first lesson in Konstantin Stanislavski's approach to method acting. <laughs> the policeman looked under the dashboard at me crying, asked for the toll, and let us go. After that, my father became very adept at throwing the coins into the dish, but he did it with anger. For him, it was like throwing away money, money he didn't have. When I turned 16, I got my junior permit, which allowed a great deal of independence, almost. 
What stood between me and my freedom was the begging. Papa enjoyed this last vestige of control. He knew how badly I wanted to drive his car. I would plead and he would answer, Katsigarichesky, nyet, categorically no, his favorite phrase. Begging to use the car became a game that I learned to play. And often it was based upon fictitious ploys, elaborate stories with false destinations, companions, and events. The events were not as important to me as my need to escape our gloomy apartment, which rested in an inversion of guilt and despair. One tactic that consistently worked with my father was to instruct my best friend, a native Nyack girl, Joanne, to ask for the car in perfect Russian. Можно нам, пожалуйста, машину сегодня? May we please have the car today? We practiced for days until she got it right. Papa found this so amusing that he softened and handed over the keys. I didn't like driving with my father. In my opinion, he was a terrible driver. Papa avoided using the brakes because he thought he would wear them out. <laughs> he didn't like to engage the clutch because it would exhaust the gears. At the gas station, it was always check the oil, check tires, check engine, clean front window, and clean the back window. One dollar gas, please. One day, my parents were driving into town failed, my papa failed to use the brakes, went through a red light and plowed into a semi-trailer truck. The car was totaled, but miraculously, my parents survived unharmed. The baron's steed was dead, his independence was clipped forever, and he never drove again. That was the end. That was the end of his driving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my, I, I, my, my friend, who I am still um, in touch with, she could still say that in Russian. It was so ingrained. <laughs> Would you say it for us once again? Можно нам, пожалуйста, машину сегодня? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to hear more of your reading, more of your writing. Do you have another piece you'd like I, to read? I do. I thought, you know, I would speak about my, my parents and my family, but <clears throat> this is a new piece. This is not in the book, but it's a new piece that I wrote. My mother and I were never uh, close. Um, it was very difficult for her. Uh, by the time she got to this country, she was, she was already tired. She was tired. She had lost a great deal. She lost. She she was very ill, often. But the hardest part was that she worked in the sewing machine factories here, mm. in this country, and that was very difficult. Uh, before I read the next piece, I want to say. I had an extraordinary thing happen the other day. Um, I was actually in the car, and my cell phone rang, and I, it doesn't usually happen, but anyway. It, but I answered it. It turned out to be my great nephew, whom I didn't know, calling from Fort Wayne, Indiana, <laughs> telling me that he, going through his grandmother's things when she passed, they found a little black book of my mother's, what he, what he thought was a journal of writing. When he sent me the pages, it was her poetry. Oh. Pages of her poetry. Now, I know I have her poetry as well. I have a book of her poetry, but this, this I've never seen. And I had translated uh, 
one. I, I managed to translate one. Um, but I was so thrilled, first of all, to meet kind of even by phone my my great nephew. Like his 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 grandfather is my half brother. Um, and uh, and and the fact that he, uh, the fact that he at seventeen, he is reading my book. I told him to put his seatbelt on because <laughs> he's going to need the seatbelt. Um, but anyway, it it was it was just a thrill to to get my mother's poetry. Yes, she was a poet. She was a, a theatrical person. She, lots of creativity and all that was basically taken away by her life, it, mm -hmm. generally, even in, in Europe and, and here. Um, so, so she was a sad person. She was mm -hmm. very sad. Um, there was also family dynamics. My book is really about family dynamics. It's about growing up in this country, but it's family dynamics and everybody has them. Uh, the, the one thing that I'm going to say is that my mother came to my father as a divorcee in Estonia with two boys, with the two boys. And my father was not always kind to the boys, especially to my, the oldest, to Kurt Marquardt, Reverend Kurt Marquardt, because he was a Lutheran minister. Uh, he, and so what happened is that she took the boys kind of under her protection and gave me to my father. Here, she's, her, she's yours. And you were the only one. You I was don't. the only one. Yeah. But she had um, a stillborn in a DP camp. She had a, a birth that she had, and that was very difficult. Um, so you can imagine my growing up basically without my mother. Mm -hmm. She was, besides working in the... In the uh, what we call the sewing machine factories. She uh, she was already tired, and that was hard. There was no time. There was no time. Right. So this I wrote. This is a new piece that I wrote recently about how uh, uh, you know having written the book. I've come full circle to my mother. I didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was a kid. Now I understand. I understand what she lost. I understand what she did, how hard she worked. And I have enormous amount of compassion for her. And um, so I wrote this. I arrive first, brimming with anticipation. I had waited a long time for this encounter. To calm myself, I order a glass of chilled rosé and a shot of cold stadichne vodka for her, and I wait. My mind is filled with our past. Why can't I recall what she called me in my childhood? Murka? Murik? Never Murichka, the most endearing. Did I ever take her to a nice restaurant where she could be pampered and spoiled with delicious food and drink? Never. Tonight, I will lavish and spoil her with a high-end delicious French dinner, the best wine, the best vodka. Will she be angry, affectionate? Will we have enough makeup time? I notice her when she first appears at the entrance of the cafe. She is standing and waiting for the maitre d' to show her to our table. She has on an unremarkable gray coat and a gray chapeau that covers her gray hair. 
She was never very tall. Her shoulders droop a little more now, and she clutches her pocketbook as she searches the cafe for a familiar face. I beckon her to our table. I stand up as she comes towards me. We stare at each other, not knowing exactly what to say. Then we embrace. The embrace is awkward, as there weren't too many embraces back then. She takes off her coat and hat and sits down, lights a cigarette, and looks at me as if to say, why did you bring me here? She is as I remember her. She is dressed in a white blouse and black skirt below her knees, simple but still elegant. Her gray, thick, wavy hair is pulled back with brown plastic combs, and her pale oval face is covered with wrinkles. I see that she has made an effort and has applied some mascara and put on red lipstick, but she can never hide that perpetual sadness which permeates her entire being. Even when she was young and beautiful and her skin soft and unmarked, she had that sad, faraway look. She looks beautiful to me. The last time I saw her, she was in an alcoholic days, trying to focus on a bridge game with my father, my future husband, and me. In her eyes, I was getting married and doing the right thing for the first time in my life. I knew I was losing my soul. Five years later, I was living in Minneapolis with my husband and two-year-old daughter when my mother fell on the floor with a cigarette in one hand and a shot of vodka in the other. A week later, she died of a massive stroke. I break the silence. Mama, I say in Russian, the language we share. Можем ли мы начать все сначала? Can we start over? She puts out her cigarette, swallows the shot of vodka, then takes my hands in hers. Можем, we can. We hold hands and look at each other. This is not an apparition, it's mama. I saw tears well up in her eyes and start to run down her cheeks. We talk, we cry, we laugh. We, she shares her poetry. I sing a gypsy song to her, our favorite. This is my legacy. What she has passed on to me, her need to write, to sing, to create, to survive. Was it a dream? A hallucination? Psychic manifestation? I don't know. I know it happened, and it seemed as real as this present moment. It is beyond words, just feeling. Mama stands up, puts on her coat and hat. There's a long, warm embrace, and then she is gone. This Vidanya Murichka, I hear her say, until next time. What a beautiful story. That was kind of like my wish. Yes, yes. She lost her, her creative life, although she sat on the couch and wrote poetry. Um, and I was adamant, adamant that I was not going to lose mine. Yes. So I, that spurred me on. That and the potato soup that she flung at me <laughs> <laughs> at one point. When I was left home, I left home. And when she flung she, the... She had a, a pot of potato soup, and she was so distraught that I was leaving because I think she was a bit envious that I was about, that I could, could walk leave. out the door. And she threw it at me. Oh, my goodness. And so I left with potato soup on my shoes. <laughs> 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 so... That's my mother and my father. So I thought that was uh, poignant in my, in my stories. Um, so we have, we're running out of time after all. I thought we had more time. OK. Um, if you have one more short piece you'd like to read. 
I would, yeah, I would. Okay. So this is my creativity now. All right. Yes. This is from, um, this is also a new story. It's not even in my, new, in my other book, Flipping the Bird, which is full of stories about my uh, pushing the envelope, basically, in my life. And I've done a lot of that. A lot of pushing the envelope. Yeah. This is quick. This is very quick. When I told my mother that I was leaving home to become an actress in New York City, she threw a pot of hot potato soup at me. She couldn't understand my need to escape the tiny dark apartment in Nyack, New York with the camphor scented claustrophobia, the sickness and sadness that permeated the walls. I had to leave, and I did, with potato soup on my shoes. I was only 19 and determined to make it in New York. I moved in with my cousin, began attending dance, acting, and singing classes. I answered the cattle call auditions where, usually after hours of waiting, the director with one swift gesture of his hand would dismiss an entire group of five foot three inch blondes, of which I was one. For nourishment, I ate 25 cent hot dogs with sauerkraut and made free hot water and ketchup soup at the automat. There was an almost instant descent down to the dregs of show business. I began go-go dancing in bars to make ends meet. Men leered as I danced in cages with my fringe fishnet stockings and red high heels. Then a break. I was hired not as a star or even in a small part, and not in New York, but in Philadelphia. I was backstage as wardrobe mistress for the nude musical Old Calcutta. <laughs> but backstage was magical, and I breathed in the perfumed whiff of glamour actors rushing past in costume or naked, and I felt a thrill in the reflected light and scandalous fame. This soup son of show business glit stopped when Frank Rizzo, the mayor, closed the show because of the nudity and obscenity. My dreams of stardom vanished. But visions of hot potato soup catapulting <laughs> through the air spurred me on. <laughs> Then, in December 1969, two years after pounding the pavement, auditioning for acting roles in New York City, I got a call that I landed the character role in the theatrical version of an old Doris Day film, a comedy entitled Tunnel of Love. Within a week, I was sitting in a Piedmont Air puddle jumper heading for a four-month tour in the Carolinas and Georgia I was going to be fed, housed, and paid as a professional actress. I wasn't sure who was flying higher, me or the plane. Night after night, I made a surprise entrance in full bloom of a stage pregnancy. Strapping on my fake belly didn't feel that glamorous, but I got laughs. I wanted more. When the tour ended in Atlanta and I was packing my bags to go home, the producer called. He was gasping. Susan, the star of his next show, The Owl and the Pussycat, had the flu and could not go on. He begged me to get the script, read the part of Doris, and board the first plane to Charlotte. Please, he said, we open tonight. The leading man, Robert Kuyper, and I had two hours to read and block the show. I wore sick Susan's wardrobe and her oversized blonde wig. Makeup was slapped onto my face, and I stood backstage as the producer explained to a packed audience that I would be playing the role of the pussycat, script in hand. Could I pull this off? The curtain rose. For one and a half hours, I laughed, I cried, 
I whirled. I became Doris, a charming part-time prostitute who falls for Felix, a nerdy bookworm writer. This, even though several times the script flew out of my hands and I lost the wig when I flipped Robert from behind a couch. The audience was in stitches. Thanks to Robert, who always stayed in his owl character, no matter what happened on stage, I was able to sail in the part of the pussycat. I stayed up all night waiting for that review. The next day, the Charlotte, North Carolina Observer ran a front page headline. Script in hand, she saved and stole the show. Oh, oh lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Marka, thank you. That was a beautiful story. I wish we had more time. I thought we had plenty, but there were so many good stories to tell. That's right, and yours as well. Thank you for that. Thank you for having me again. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Tonight's guest on Words Carry Us live stream from Greenkill has been Margarita Mandoff, and also known as Morka. Currently on ex exhibition in the gallery at Greenkill is the work of artists Gray Ivor Morris, Sean McCarthy, and Margaret Still through the rest of March until J Saturday, April 27th. You're invited to view the work, exhibition hours for the 2024 season are Saturday and Sunday from 1 to 6 p.m. To arrange for a special appointment to visit the gallery, please call 347-689-2323. Located at 229 Greenkill Avenue in Kingston, New York, Greenkill is a public arts performance and education space. For more information about exhibitions as well as live stream and live audience events, contact us at 229 Greenkill at Greenkill Dot org. As always, we are grateful to David Shell, who organizes, directs, and makes things happen here at Greenkill. Our thanks go to Shirley Hoffman Warren, who composed and performed our musical theme with the assistance of recording engineer Jason Warren. Many thanks to you for tuning in and watching us on YouTube. And very special thanks to tonight's in-studio audience. Again, a guest tonight on Words Carry Us live stream from Greenkill has been Margarita Mandoff, also known as Morka. I hope you've enjoyed Words Carry Us for March, March 19, 2024. I'm your host, Betty McDonald. Green Kill, out. <laughs>